good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. It's a great pleasure to be with you uh, tonight here for uh, this uh, strength session, the fireplace station, which is something that uh, we are not used to. Uh, but I think it's going to be very interesting, and I have the, the, the great pleasure uh, to present uh, Professor Arturo Casadeval, who is uh, the chair of the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, he actually uh, made yesterday a very impressive and a very interesting um, um, presentation on the, on his work and I think you the the format of, of this session is really to ask him directly uh, all the questions that you may have regarding uh, his research regarding your his opinion on any topics I think that it discussed yesterday so it's really a, an open session uh, you can interact whenever you want you can ask questions you can uh, everything is permitted so and allowed. So, Arturo, I think uh, uh, if you want to make uh, maybe a, a, a quick introduction, uh, and then we we can start with uh, with the first question. If anybody wants to kick the meeting, I guess my question would be: um, uh, Fred. Fred is also here. Well, he was a presenter, right, Fred? Uh, uh, no, I was not on the agenda yesterday. Oh, okay. So, uh, you know, it's an open, uh, I'm happy to talk about anything. My talk was on virulence. We talked about a lot of things from the end of the dinosaurs to weather forecasting, uh, to virulence, um, everything is on the table. And uh, my view about science is that, that um, science is fun. If you should think about big problems and everything should be discussable. So I'm happy to chat. So maybe I can start with the, the, the first question just to uh, throw something. Uh, you've been discussing yesterday a lot about the, the, the relationship with, uh, with the fungi and everything that was happening after. Uh, but it is, I think, more and more clear now that there is a, a, a very intimate relationship between the microbiome and the microbiome. So how all the all the evolution that you've been sh um, showing regarding the fungi, do we have something that is comparable looking at the bacteria? Um, I I'm not aware of it, but I I am I suspect that the same applies. the The big difference, if you think about bacteria and fungi, is that the majority of fungal diseases and the most fungal pathogenic fungi, except for Candida their modifieds and maybe pneumocystis are acquired from the environment. Whereas most of our bacterial diseases, we tend to acquire from each other. There are some examples, for example, Legionella, or some that you may get, but, but that's a big difference in that, uh, in terms, so, so most of the bacterial diseases that we get are already host adapted in some way. Whereas if you go outside and you breathe, Aspergillus, so you breathe histoplasma or something, that organism doesn't necessarily have any experience with you or you with it. And by the way, all viruses obviously are host adapted. Those you get directly from other host. And parasites are somewhat mostly host adapted in some way. I mean, think about it. If you get malaria, you're getting it host adapted to a mosquito. But some of the other parasites you can get directly from drinking water or, or getting eggs or something. Those will come directly from the environment. May I ask a question? Yeah. Can I, can I ask what your thoughts are on, on Candida auris and whether we should continue to worry? Is it, or is it here to stay? So I, I think the second part of your question, the answer is yes, uh, because once we know that it gets into a hospital, it's very hard to get out, that we know. And therefore, but to, but to me, the, the problem of candida auris is primarily one of infection control. If you have good infection control and you can control it, it tends not to be as big of, a, of or it, it's manageable. 
But I, I think that to me, the, the problem of Candida auris is where did it come from? Why did it appear in three continents at the same time with different strains? Uh, and this is why we have proposed that Candida auris is the first example of a fungus that has adapted in the environment to higher temperatures and can now defeat the, the, the human thermal protection. So if that's the case, should we expect others? That's, that's my concern. That's my concern. And we, the only way we will know about this is you will again have a situation like Candida auris in which a new organism is reported and then it's reported in, in multiple places, potentially at the same time. There is no good explanation it, it, on how this organism emerges in Venezuela, South Africa, and India at the same time. And, and, and by the way, a fourth uh, came from Iran uh, about a year later that has now been established. So there are about five lineages come out. And people say, well, you know, the world hasn't uh, heated that, that much. Uh, it's only maybe one degree. Why is this happening? And I think, and my answer to them is you're not thinking, you got to think about this differently. Think about the number of really hot days. Every really hot day, very hot day is a selection event. All the microbes have to make it through it. So as, as you increase the number of days over 40 degrees centigrade in Europe, all those microbes are basically put under tremendous selection pressure. It doesn't matter that the average temperature is one degree. What matters is the extremes. Arturo, I wonder if we might pivot a little bit. Um, as much as I love uh, your discussion of fungi and dinosaurs, uh, about your current thoughts now about using convalescent uh, plasma um, for COVID-19 and uh, where your thinking is evolving on, on this. Okay, so uh, this is where I have spent most of my last year and I continue to spend a lot of my time. Uh, this, so when COVID first struck, there was nothing. And here in the United States, based on history, the, um, the FDA allowed the use of convalescent plasma, initially as part of a registry, and then when some data accumulated, of which I was the last author of the New England Journal paper, Michael Joyner was the first of the mail, uh, it, it, it gained what is known as emergency use authorization. This is my view about it. My view about it is that you have a therapy that is cheap, associated with efficacy in some, but not all studies, has low toxicity, and, uh, and it's one of the very few things that we have available. So if I get sick, I want it. Uh, and I basically uh, urge people to think about it that way. This is not adriamycin. We're not talking about putting people through a course of adriamycin or amphotericin B. We're talking about giving them one unit of high tide plasma. And here in the United States, we pu just published in eLife a paper in which we look at the first half million, and on a population level, we can, we can estimate that it saved 100,000 lives. But the most disturbing part of this is that beginning in, in, Jan, in, um, in uh, December, usage of convalescent plasma dropped from 40% uh, of all hospitalized patients to 10%. And we have been able to document an increase in mortality. So 30,000 extra deaths. And why has this happened? Because people have responded, for example, to the negative randomized controlled trials. Recovery had, a, as you know, found no difference, except in some small subsets, there was a trend. Uh, and what I would say to them is, look, you're taking care of patients, you gotta look at all the data. And a lot of the data, the observational data is positive, the epidemiological data is positive, the mechanism data is positive, and we have some RCTs, the only double-blinded RCT with, that used convalescent plasma as a control carried out by Columbia University and Brazil showed a 50% drop in mortality. That is my view about it. I think that physicians need to justify why they're not using it rather than justify why they're using it. Thank you. I, I fully support your uh, conclusions. 
Yeah. And uh, and I and thank you. Uh, it's been a it's been a very difficult past year because the whole use of plasma became politicized. I mean, who would have you know? Uh, and I think you know what I mean. Can I ask a question to follow up on that? Yeah. Uh, so now with the large, especially in certain countries, a uh, percentage of the population vaccinated, but with people still getting sick, uh, would you still recommend the use of convalescent plasma in patients that do become pretty severely symptomatic, not needing a hospital, but pretty severely symptomatic? But so for, for our patient, we have a trial here that will be completed next month in which we're looking at the use of plasma as an outpatient. Clearly, look, antibody therapies, if they're going to work, they're going to work early. This is an antiviral, right? So you, there is no way antibody is going to reverse inflammation in the lung. And yet, so the earlier you get it, the better. So what we're hoping is that if we get a positive signal, we have about 1,000 patients. We should be able to look at the codes the, uh, soon. But the, based on the Lipster study in Argentina, they show a 60% effect if you treat early. So what I would say is if you're high risk, if you're vaccinated, if you get sick, you know, clearly something happened to vaccine immunity that did not prevent you from getting sick. So if a provider that it shows efficacy as an outpatient, then I, I would, uh, again, we are talking, we're talking about trying to prevent death here by progressing disease and you're giving an antiviral. So what I would say is the data are not there yet, but the data may be out in a couple of months that would support what you're suggesting. But I, when you think of what's happening today, I don't know if you're following the news, but Africa has been hit really hard. Africa doesn't have monoclonal antibodies. They don't have remdesivir, but they have survivors and they have blood transfusion services. So I think it's very, very important that all physicians and people educate themselves as to what is the data rather than saying, well, they did this study and it didn't work because yeah, you have something with low toxicity that might save a lot of lives. If I may rebound on that, what are your thoughts on the, um, uh, on the different variants and uh, prescribing pla convalescent plasma uh, with different variants circulating and- uh, So that, you, uh, Benoit, that's a really good question. We just have a paper accepted in, uh, in Nature Communications uh, that look here in the United States at 100,000 patients from the registry and was able to, to ask the question, this is only with machine learning, by the way, the preprint is posted. So people are interested, they can go get it. With machine learning, you show that the efficacy of plasma drops after 150 miles, let's say 200 kilometers. So, so if you if you if you're in Paris and you take Paris and, and you take Parisian plasma, you're much more likely to get a benefit than if you take plasma from Marseille or another city. Uh, and what it's telling you is that the variants are out there; they're generating s subtle variations in antigenicity that 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 do so. Now, because of the law of mass action which is, as you know, the more antibody you have, the more likely you are to bind. If you get really high titer plasma, I don't think it matters. If you, because you can still neutralize as a result of just driving the reaction, the neutralization reaction forward. The old Le Chetelier's principle, if you increase the reactants, you increase the, the products. So in this case, the reactants are antibody and, uh, and virus. So, uh, so I think that if you have very high titer, it probably doesn't matter. And this is why there's a lot of interest here. Some groups are organizing to make what is called Bax plasma, to, to get plasma from even people who had COVID and then got vaccinated, because those tend to have enormous amounts of antibody. Log orders more than you mount normally. So a unit of that, which are, uh, uh, could provide protection against pr pr probably any, any, any variant. May I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Hi, Professor. Uh, first, thank you for this valuable session. We met last year's fireplace. <laughs> 
presentation and we had a great time. And uh, my question about uh, what's your opinion uh, toward those mRNA vaccination? Uh, will my be opinion, necessary or safe, maybe for new mutation? So my opinion is that, that they're amazing. They're amazing vaccines. Uh, and what people need to realize is the te technological sophistication that went into this. Uh, you, um, but, but in answer to your question, to me, the great promise of it is that you can generate it very rapidly because all you really need to do, let's say a new variant arises that defeats the, the current mRNA vaccine. All you really need to do is take the new the new spike protein, clone it into a vector, then that vector make mRNA from it, and then put it into a lip into a vesicle, a lipid vesicle, and you have a new vaccine. So it took about eight or nine months to develop these vaccines. I think that if we run, if humanity runs into the problem of new variants that are defeated by the vaccine, you can probably get a new vaccine out in two to three months. So I think that it's, you know, it's, it's a great celebration of science to the, the, the very rapid way those things were developed and the enormous amount of energy that went into it. And it, not only basic science, but clinical science. You know, think about, they did a beautiful clinical trials. They were able to do things very rapidly. And in a, in a terrible year, uh, the story of the vaccines is something that, that I think we can all celebrate. But based on what you're saying, we are, we are going very rapidly to a third shot, I guess. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and oh, I, yeah. How do you think? Oh, yeah. And I, and, uh, and I think that humanity has already lost the chance to contain this thing. We had a chance of containing it. And we, and we were not able to. This is not going to be SARS-1. So I think that once it becomes endemic, then we will have new variants arising. And I think that probably in the future, you'll be getting uh, your COVID, your new COVID variant with influenza shot. But I do think life will go back to normal. I just don't think that we are going to, by normal, I mean a, a, a situation in which in which is as manageable as 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 flu, but I don't think I don't think that this is going to again be uh, we're going to be able to take it out of the human population, especially when we're giving it to the pets. You know, the the dogs, the cats, the zoo animals now have gotten SARS COVID two, so it's endemic. Uh, so if you can allow me to ask now, you sure. see in many countries in the world that the Delta strain is the most predominant, predominant one. So we can expect in like two or three months, like another strain will be the predominant from any other area from the world. Mohammed, this is the way you, 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 this is the way to think about it. Every single person who gets COVID is a chance for a new variant because the, the, the virus is error prone. So the more cases you have, the more variants you will have. It's unavoidable. This is why I think it's so important to try to get as many people vaccinated as possible. The variants emerge spontaneously as a result of the error prone polymerase. Uh, this is, is the basic biology of the virus. So the answer is yes, I think we're gonna we're going to have the delta, the gamma, the epsilon, and it's just going to go. Uh, and, the, and unless we can get a lot of the po human population vaccinated or immune as a result of having had COVID, we are going to continue to have waves of this uh, going through. So, so allow me another question. You recommend more and more vaccination, but like what about the data that was like published maybe two weeks back about the Pfizer vaccine and efficacy on the delta strain and these uh, new strains, if we something that we should be afraid from it, because I, I I think the risk from COVID is enormous compared to the risk from the vaccine. Look, anything you do in medicine has some risk. If I give you an if I give you an aspirin, you have a risk of having a, a, a 
bleeding in the gut. Yeah, sorry, it's not about the risk, about the efficacy itself. Of the well, I think the, I, I think you're I think you're right that today the efficacy is less than it was a year ago, and that's because the vaccines reflect the original strains. But the efficacy, the back, the benefit that you're getting is still enormous relative to not being vaccinated. So I, uh, you know, I mean, I, I I implore everyone to take this vaccine. It is the only way we're going to control this thing. Yes, I agree. Totally agree with you. Yeah. In addition to uh, vocational images, yeah. Thank you for your question. Can I ask a question, please? Sure. Do you think there is the risk of deploying lots of passives in uh, sites where eye transmission is occurring? Do you think that can accelerate the generation of new variants? Is there, no. is there a risk? No, I think in fact, the deployment of vaccines in any area, I think that variants will ar arise no matter what. It, it's, it's a probability, everybody who has COVID has a certain probability of generating a variant, a new one. So if you deploy vaccines in any population where there is a lot of COVID, if you prevent some cases, you have to reduce the chance of new variants arising. So, um, so I think that even areas that are being hit very hard, if we can get them vaccine, it, we, the humanity is going to be better off rapidly. Javier. Yes, uh, going back to the use of uh, convalescent plasma, you mentioned uh, and you insisted that this should be used early it makes all the sense of the world of the world which means at the same time that this should be used in the outpatients by definition because they are not yet sick enough to be admitted to hospital now there are many people get that get covid and they have initially at this at least mild disease and it's difficult to sort out who should be the best candidate for a plasma can you elaborate on that? Is there any hint? Any yes, uh, Javier, that's an excellent question. So let's take the beginning of your question first. Um, the, the point is that by the time you get into the hospital, I think Javier is making the point that by that time, the reason you get admitted is because you're short of breath. And the reason you're short of breath is because you have lung inflammation. And by that point, right. um, yeah. and, and you're not going to get the benefit of it. Well, the data are that some proportion of individuals benefit. That is being shown over and over again. And probably the ones who benefit are the ones who make antibody late uh, in that case. So, so even if you look at the recovery study, if you look at some of the other data that's coming out of Europe, individuals who don't make antibody early are at high, are at high chance of dying. That's known. So if this, is a, uh, this is a disease where you, if you make antibody early, you're much more likely to survive. So those people that are showing up in the emergency room, short of breath, some group still benefits by getting the plasma. The majority don't because it's already too, right. too, too early. But if you could give it early, for example, what the Argentinians did was really smart. They gave it to people that were older, uh, older than 75 years with, with risk factors. That's a population that's very, has a very high risk of death. So that's a population you can intervene in uh, and, and make a big difference in mortality. So, I mean, right now in, in the United States and in, in other developed countries, you have monoclonals. So you can get monoclonals as an outpatient, but for most of the world, there ain't no monoclonal. So if you happen, to be in an under uh, a resourced area where there isn't going to be antivirals and one is at high risk and one can get a unit of plasma early, you know, you may be able to save a life early. But you're right. As we need to think about how to give this stuff as an outpatient to the ones who are at high risk. Okay. Maybe a, a, a more theoretical question. Uh, we, we've been trying a lot of drugs against COVID. And actually what is 
making a difference in terms of mortality is really not the drug directed against the virus. Um, do you think there is a potential, uh, do you think there is a chance that we could find something, we could find a window, we can find the right drug? And uh, is it worth trying? Because I really think that uh, the virus it itself is not the, 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 the problem, but it's more the, the relationship with the host. What are your thoughts on that? Right. So the reason you get sick with COVID is what kills you with COVID is your own immune system. Okay. I mean, basically you mount an over exuberant inflammatory response. And once you have inflammation in the lung, you don't vent, you, you don't have gas exchange. So that's how people die. But, but so, so the question is, so once you're sick, you're really going to need to modulate inflammation. That's why steroids reduce mortality. And that's why some people, you know, may still get a benefit uh, from antibodies at that level. But I think that the way to think about this is antivirals are early in the disease and the antivirals form into two main categories, small molecules, uh, as well as, um, as antibodies. And then later in the disease, you're gonna need immunomodulators. Remdesivir is a weak antiviral. And it's, been a, it's really not been convincingly associated with reduction in mortality. It's been, re, it's been associated with a reduction in improvements. And I, I think everyone in this call can agree that if you, that if you mess viral replication, you're gonna get some benefit. But, but I, I am very optimistic though that eventually drugs will be made. And the reason for that is the president. We have drugs against herpes, we have drugs against HIV, we have drugs against hepatitis uh, viruses. So I think that it's a matter of time before somebody finds a small molecule that will interfere with replication. But that therapy is gonna have to be given early too. By the time you show up at the emergency room with floor inflammation, it's, it's, it may be too late. Think about the, the, the antivirals for influenza uh, Tamiflu only work very early because in influenza it's the same pathogenesis, it's inflammation. May I also ask a question? Yes, Gunter. Hello. Uh, there are several reports on, on the use of antiseptics uh, such as hypochloric acid or enclotarine used as inhalation uh, for control of, of, of viral numbers based on the paradigm that uh, high viral numbers or impaired control by the immune system is associated with a poor outcome. What is your opinion on that? You know, I don't know that data. I haven't looked at it, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised. The, the history of infectious diseases is that topical agents don't do as well as systemic agents. This is, they, they do have a role, for example, in, in lowering, uh, if you have a wound and you can put a topical agent you can lower the amount of microbes in it. You can do that, for example, in eradicating sometimes resistant organisms. But in general, the reason it doesn't work as well is because these organisms get in deeper very rapidly. And you're gonna have viral replication under the surface. And that's, uh, that's why I think that we need to also, I, I'm not saying that it isn't gonna work. I'm just saying the history suggests that, that you're gonna need a systemic agent. May I add a question uh, in addition? So yeah. there are also data primarily from the New York group on the anti-interferon antibodies, which is uh, found with some prevalence in elderly pa patients. Do you think there's a place of, of, of uh, injecting type one interference in patients with, with high risk of, of uh, severe? Yes. yes, but here is the problem. We, we don't know, we don't know. So, so in my presentation, I talked about the damage framework and that we have a paper out that discusses how to apply it to COVID. And the answer is yes. If you can catch somebody very early, right? Especially somebody who's not mounting a strong interferon response, you could imagine that giving that person interferon alpha or beta could promote the rapid immune response to benefit. The problem that we have is that we don't have the technology right now to say who's going to benefit or not. But I think in theory, there are probably some people who benefit, but it's going to be a short window. If you then go a little further, it's probably not going to work. Yeah. Thanks a lot. 
When you say you don't have the technology, what do you mean exactly? Well, what are your thoughts and the potential path that we, we could explore? So, so when doctors treat you in the hospital, they usually treat you based on experience, right? Uh, this patient does well, this patient doesn't do well. We don't have a way for if you show up with fever and COVID to know where you are in the, path, in the damage part of the response. We don't know if the damage that you're getting, for example, is due to viral replication, in which case an antiviral will work better, or if, the, or if, you, cross, or if you cross the boundary to immune-mediated damage. So a doctor doesn't know whether, for example, what is the optimal time to give steroids. And consequently, stero corticosteroids are probably being overused. And part of the reason is that we just don't have that technology. You cannot go to the bedside and know where an individual is in the inflammatory curve. If you could, you could greatly uh, probably improve therapy with existing agents. By the way, one of the problems has been that, you know, steroids have been, the, if you look at the recovery study, which was very influential, showed that administration of, of dexamethasone was associated with a 20% reduction in mortality. Which patients? ICU patients. That piece of data was then extrapolated to all hospitalized patients. So today, 90% of patients in the hospital are receiving steroids. And to me, that's a major problem because think about what's happening with mucor in India or what's happening with aspergillus in the Netherlands or in some of our hospitals. We are basically using it too early. And part of the reason is because you don't know when is the optimal time to use it. So they're using it early because they want to prevent the patient from going to the ICU. But the majority of those patients will have never gone to the ICU. And the net result is that you're immunosuppressing them. And if you're immunosuppressing them too early, well, that's going to aggravate the, the SARS-CoV-2. So as an example where I think some uh, technology, uh, a science needs to progress so we can do better uh, against these diseases. A rapid way to know where you are inflammatory on the bedside. But to, to add on that, uh, we, we have a, a couple of studies that suggested that to put on the top of corticosteroids some tocizilumab could improve the patient. So That's do correct. you use it? And uh, when do you start right. it? Right. So if you look at the tocizilumab data, as you anybody who followed it, it's been a zigzag. There were studies suggesting it studied, it's a very similar to the convalescent plasma. Finally, a study, uh, again, recovery by looking at large numbers of patients showed that there was a benefit putting it on top. But it's probably a, a small number of patients benefit only at the time in which IL-6 is a problem. Uh, when you have, when, when the people have looked at autopsy studies, people who died no longer have IL-6. So, uh, so you probably get to a point at which it no longer works because inflammation has run its course. Again, timing and again, the limitation to do better, we need to have real time inflammatory data. Do, do people in the audience use some kind of markers because it has been suggested things like ferritin, CRP, uh, even IL-6 levels. Um, is it something that is in the routine somewhere? Yes. It's not being used routinely. Well, but go ahead, Javier. I was going to say that patients that are sick enough to be admitted to hospital, we are very concerned precisely about what has been already discussed. Uh, timing is critical. When to give to tocilizumab, for instance, is a big question. Now we learned that if we do that at the ICU level, it's too late. And we are learning as well that if we use this in the floor, maybe it's too early. So that's part of the problem. Again, as Arturo mentioned, uh, uh, I, I was very interested in using convalescent plasma because that's something that we have available 
uh, monoclonal antibody is another story, and it's not easy to get it. Uh, well, it's impossible to get it at, at, in Spain, for instance. It would be very difficult. So I was thinking about uh, how early is early enough to give uh, convalescent plasma or to give uh, tocilizumab. And I was looking for an easy marker, something that when patients come in, which is more or less day seven or eight of the uh, disease, if, for instance, being 75 is fine, half comorbidities is fine. There are two risk factors easy to uh, imagine. And I thought that maybe lymphopenia, if the lymphopenia is low enough, maybe this would be a marker to use uh, convalescent plasma, imagining that this group of patients probably are not good producers of antibodies. But of yeah. course, we haven't shown, we haven't studied that seriously in detail uh, in a prospective manner. That's all I can say. You know, IL-6 for us is useful. This is in ferritin, of course, as well. Uh, but not a single marker is enough, uh, in my view, right now. That's all I can I, say. Yeah, I think Javier is 100% is correct. I mean, we need something uh, that would allow you to know what this therapy... The problem with all these therapies is windows. You Things work, and the, and the problem is that the window is different for different patients. Some patients go from being well to being in the hospital in three days. Other, others show up much later. And uh, so some people are suggesting, well, why don't you just measure antibodies? And um, that, that is a potential way. You could just take a unit that can be done relatively quickly. You could check for antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. The problem is that there is also data that a lot of the antibodies that are made early are not very good. Uh, in fact, some of these early antibody responses may have been memory responses to the other coronavirus that are not neutralized. So just knowing that may not give you, uh, clearly if there is no antibody, then you giving something makes a lot of sense. But finding it, uh, you need to be careful about saying, well, then I'm not going to use it because the truth of the matter is that the antibody that you make at, at, at three months when you're in the convalescent period is very different than the one that you make at 10 days. Uh, that has been documented. So, you know, I, 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 one optimistic thing is how much we learn in such a short time. Uh, if you think about, uh, it's been a, a tremendous human tragedy. It's been an assault in humanity from nature, but the amount of knowledge to where we are today from a year ago, it's something that I think we need to celebrate. Arturo, if I might uh, pivot one more time, understanding the absolute origin of SARS-CoV-2 could be really helpful in, in uh, pandemic planning for the future, and yet it's, it's so politicized now. How hard should we be pushing uh, on trying to understand the origin of this virus? So um, in full disclosure, I just have a paper submitted uh, on the use of science to try to sort out the origins of SARS-CoV-2. I think, Fred, that we need to find out what happened here, or at least try to find out. Because, look, if, if we have had three coronavirus outbreaks in the first 21 years of the 21st century, that means that we are probably going to have another one by 2030. And we need to, to know it, what, where these things are, co are coming from. Certainly, if, if, if it's the labscape hypothesis, I think that we need to know, we need to redouble the efforts to make sure that that doesn't ever happen again. Um, but I, the, I feel that the overwhelming amount of data, su suggest, unless somebody is able to provide human intelligence that this happened, that we're dealing likely with a zoonosis. Uh, and I feel that no matter how hard people work at it, unless there is what we call a smoking gun, unless there is evidence, look, if it came from a lab, somebody knows about it. That we know, right? Somebody would know about it. If, if nobody knows about it, then it's likely it didn't come out of a lab. But, but it seems to me that at the end of the day, we're going to be left with probabilities. And that is the, probably the best that we're going to have. Uh, but I think from those probabilities, look, this is the biggest thing that happened in my lifetime. I mean, uh, it, it, you know, 
uh, it's and and the thought that it could happen again. And and look at the uh, this is a virus with a one percent mortality. What would have happened if it was five percent, ten percent mortality? For most of the world, the light stayed on, the food gets got delivered, society didn't have a breakdown. So back to your question, I think it's really important that we do what we can, but I think we need to be ready to accept that we may only, we may not know. What do you think, Fred? You're thinking about this too. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. I'm, I'm not quite sure that um, even with really solid evidence from multiple sources that everybody's going to believe it. Um, I, I, I think agree. that's that's why I'm concerned about the politicization, but I fully agree with you. We need to push. It's so important for uh, future pandemic planning to have a sense about the pathway of this emergence that we need to push forward. Right, I, I would agree. Politics. Yeah. There was a question by Lillian, I think. Hi, uh, good morning or good afternoon. Hi, Lillian. Here in the world. I'm in Miami, Florida. Um, I, I have a couple of questions as our numbers have doubled in the last two weeks. And uh, I am seeing about 8% of breakthrough infections post-vaccination. And all, I just had a call with the health department trying to, you know, try to forecast uh, what's going to be coming and also how effective are the vaccines when we're hearing a mix and we continue to confuse our medical community and the public when we have France and Israel already giving third booster shots to immunocompromised patients while I have one of the lower, largest solid organ transplant centers in the country and we're still unable to make a decision when the CDC is saying no booster shots yet. So the fact that we don't have and as you're trying to, to predict the next pandemics, I think one of the important things that we have yet not learned after a year of this is we don't have consistent medical sound decisions and the way we communicate these to the public, we continue to create mistrust. I don't trust our, our, our leadership anymore because they say stop wearing masks, use an honor code when 50% of the country is still unvaccinated. So, so one of my questions is, with these breakthrough infections that we're seeing, the increased spread of the Delta variant, when, when are we gonna recommend third booster shots, if you have any sense, for immunocompromised selected populations? I'm not advocating for third doses on everyone. Um, is they're valuable or not in checking antibodies? Because I routinely check antibodies in, in some of these populations and breakthrough infections. I'm finding that they have antibodies, yet they have severe disease. And in unvaccinated patients, we really need to get the message out that they really need to get protected because still we're seeing an increase in admissions and the majority are the unvaccinated. I don't know what you're seeing in the rest of the world. I'm just very concerned that things in Miami were much better and now we're, we're at, we went from 50 to 100 hospitalizations in two weeks. So Lillian, I think that you are describing what we're gonna see in the rest of the country. So here in Maryland and Hopkins, we have very few cases, but that's because we have a high, something like 80% of the city has been vaccinated. But it's inevitable that some of these variants that are emerging are, are the, this vaccine that I got was to the original virus, you know, and it, it gives you some protection against all other ones, but it will lose, it will lose with time. So I do think that, that boosters are coming. I, I have heard discussion of physicians pl uh, planning to do it on themselves. That is to take, they, they're completely vaccinated with the, either the Pfizer or Moderna to go to the pharmacy and get the J and J shot, which is heterologous immunity because now you're crossing vaccines. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Look, the, the messaging has been confusing, but I, I, this is what I would say. Um, we got to be gentle. I mean, the, the public health authorities are trying to do the best they can with incomplete information. And there are major differences of opinion. You know, today we have uh, Pfizer approaching the government about a booster shot. Over the weekend, we had Dr. Fauci saying that we didn't need a booster shot. <laughs> Correct. FDA and CDC said this morning, we don't need a booster shot. And, and the same news says Pfizer is advocating for a third booster. So I think right. that Again, there might be political interest. There might be Pfizer just wants to sell more vaccine. I, I mean, we don't know all the details. We don't have, there is a symmetry of information. However, I, I do feel that, I, and this is a call to action for everyone. I do think masks were working. 
when we relax that we will relax the masking measures worldwide we started seeing an increase so whether well we decide what to do with the vaccines and we get more scientific data let's let's focus at least on sending the message that people please mask again you know that that let at me, least is something we can do and it's cheap Lillian let me ask you a question are you using plasma we have not been, we were using plasma very early on. We have really uh, limited the use of plasma. I'm using more monoclonal antibodies and I'm seeing a significant increase in the use of monoclonal. And that was another question. We are even on vaccinated people coming in with symptoms, even if with detectable antibodies, if they have risk factors, I'm just giving them monoclonal. And I, again, I don't have great data to say that the monoclonal will add a booster protection against these variant strains, but I'm concerned if I am seeing low levels of, of antibody and what I usually do is you give me a history of vaccination, we check antibodies, no detectable antibodies, we give monoclonal. Unless it's someone who's a transplant recipient we don't even check antibodies because our assay detects the spike protein. Um, we're going to get an assay that will detect both spike and, and, and nucleocapsid. But in the meantime, if someone has risk factors and I can avoid a death, I'll rather give them the monoclonal than plasma. That's, that's my take on this. And the monoclonal is a 10-minute infusion in the ER. Plasma, it's, it's a little more complicated and you have to call the blood bank, make sure it's high titer plasma. I don't know what you're doing or others. Well, I, I think that it's variable. In New York City, you have some hospitals using plasma and other hospitals not using plasma. So just like you th you're talking about the differences in, uh, in messaging, uh, your care will change depending on where you check into the United States. Uh, and it reflects what the physicians think in a particular place. My, my, here is some thought for you. Your monoclonals only bind to a single, a small part of the protein. So one of the monoclonals, the Lily monoclonal was already defeated by the variants. No, we're not using, we, are, we, we stopped using you, Lily back in March. You're using we, the Regeneron cocktail. We're using Regeneron because it's double. It's targeting two, right. and we had data. We had already preliminary data since March that they, it, Lily, when, when we were using Bamla November through February, that's what we had available. But since March, everything has been converted to yeah. Regeneron. In fact, we saw the beginning. We saw that beginning to fail because at the beginning, everybody who got the monoclonals didn't get hospitalized, and then later, a few months later, you begin to get people hospitalized after the monoclonals. But the monoclonal half life is twenty eight days. Yeah. So what's the half life of the plasma antibody? Same. It's the same because it's IgG is is. But the big difference is that with plasma, you get biological variability. That is, you get a lot of very different types of antibodies at a smaller amount. With the monoclonals, you get only two, two sites with a lot of antibody. So, because so, we're part of the Hopkins uh, prophylaxis trial, we have the prophylaxis and the treatment. So, I, I oh, don't you're, think part, you're, you're part of our trial. Yeah, I've been working with uh, Shmuel since. With Shmuel and David. Yeah. Well, I hope you get us some patience because, you know, things have to slow it down. It's been a challenge. So I'm not the PI on that study, but that has been a challenge because you have to, you know, it, to infuse plasma, you need to have a place where you're going to infuse it 24-7. Monoclonal, I send the patient to the ER, they get the infusion, they're out. It's, it's, so that's one of the challenges, I think, with the plasma. For the hospitalized ones, yes, plasma is an option if we do it early and they don't have detectable antibodies. Uh, but what I'm finding with the plasma is by the time they typically give it, we, we were more aggressive at the beginning. It may be a little late. Once, once the patient needs tocilizumab, plasma is useless. Great, unless they have no antibodies. Unless they have no antibodies, yes. Right, unless, but your, your, the data for the, tra we are, we seen a lot of UCR plasma and transplant patients uh, in, in, in Hopkins hospitals. Well, we've been doing transplant and transplant exchange, uh, plasma exchange. Yeah. Plasma exchange, yeah. Oh boy. There is a question by Mrs. Schneidler. If you yeah, want to. Hello. Thank you for the great discussion. Um, I have two connected questions. Um, it is interesting to see a discussion from many parts of the world. Some give the third vaccination or think about it. And a lot of countries uh, can't even give the first one. And I think this is really a big discussion point as well. And um, we have a lot of step backs to go to the uh, therapeutic uh, plasma discussion. And I have two questions for the theme. The first one is, um, I think this is really an interesting point for Africa or Asia, for the poorer countries, because it's 
normally easy to get uh, plasma. But uh, I think it is not really without risk uh, due to the higher prevalence of a lot of uh, blood diseases in these countries as well. And you need a lot of uh, lab technique and uh, a lot of controls that you have uh, uh, clean plasma for these people. And I think this is perhaps a limiting factor for this uh, therapeutic approach. The second one is... Um, Plasma administration is a kind of intervention in the immune system. And um, we have large studies about intensive care patients and the administration of blood, blood transfusions. And uh, we know that this poses the mortality risk. And um, how do you see the administration of plasma in outpatients from this point of view? So I think you're right. I think that the safety of plasma is dependent very much so on your capacity to test the plasma, to rule out infectious diseases, to rule out, you know, a variety of, of issues. Uh, but I will tell you that here in the United States, probably we, we passed half a million and the randomized controlled trials have shown that it's relatively, it's relatively safe. It's, it's like everything else. Some people get infusion reactions. Uh, you know, you stop the plasma, you slow it, you restart it later. So, so I, I, I think that I think yeah, I think you're right. I think that with any therapy, you need to you need to safety is foremost. But but the second part of your question is actually very interesting because you talk about it being an immune therapy. You're right. Plasma does have is an antiviral, but the anti, but the antibodies also modulate the immune response. And um, and you know probably we don't know enough to take advantage of that yet. But I, the, the, way I, I, the way I'm looking at this is we're going to have an, a few more years before we can get most of the population vaccinated. There is going to be a lot of COVID running through a lot of the world during that time. Most of the world is not going to have antivirals. Most of this world is not going to have monoclonals. So, but they will have plasma. And maybe the thing that we should be thinking about in trying to help is to think about, you know, how to provide help with, with safety more safety ways to test the plasma to make sure that you don't pass hepatitis, HIV, or anything like that. I think that's a great point that is often not discussed. We talk about helping with vaccines. We talk about helping with antivirals or something. We may need to provide help with logistics to, to actually make this thing safer. Okay. <laughs> okay. We've been all over the place. I think yeah, there is a question a in about the dinosaurs. It's been a wonderful, a wonderful 50 minutes. We talked about pra uh, practice in Jacksonville uh, to talk about Candida Oris. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. If there are no further questions, I don't know. I think there is a question in the chat. In the chat. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Let's go to the chat. I missed the Candida Oris part, but I, I, because I was late, sorry, but I, I would love to have another 50 minutes to talk about that in the future, because it's, it's a huge challenge. And the main one is diagnostics. And if it's a diagnostic challenge to get it locally in Miami, where we are, I can't imagine in, in developing countries where it's impossible to test in a timely manner. And the only way to control this, since we have no way to decolonize the patient, it's how do you identify them quickly to avoid the spread? So if I miss the discussion, let me know if it's recorded, so I'll watch it later. Well, we did a little bit of that. I mean, uh, before I go to the question in the chat, the idea was just a candida forest, maybe the first fungus to break through or thermal barrier by adapting to higher temperatures. Most fungi cannot cause human disease because they cannot grow at 37 degrees, but they are adapting rapidly with global changes. So the question in the chat uh, has to do with the problem of uh, what is reversible, and in particular, lung fibrosis. So what you have is you have damage. Damage triggers inflammation. If inflammation goes on for a while, you get fibrosis, scar tissue. We don't have right now the medical knowledge to reverse that. Once you have fibrosis, it's like you have a scar. You have it forever. Uh, the question then becomes is how much fibrosis you have and how much function you're left. 
if this is why some people require a long transplant afterwards because you cannot get that back. But I think that in the future, and this is something that I think medicine will get us there. I don't know whether it'll be in 10 years or another 50 years. You're going to be able to reverse that. You're going to be able to instruct the cells to basically re fix just like today we're able to to do so many things in 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 uh in oncology and in hematology uh but right now that doesn't happen and i think the the issue then is once you have fibrosis how much lung function do you have left and if you don't have sufficient then the only thing we can do is a lung transplant you want to comment on that lillian since you're on the front line yeah, so, so I, I'll tell you from personal experience. Um, we have seen patients with lung fibrosis that we've had to transplant. It was the only way to, you know, to make sure we oxygenate those lungs, especially if they were transplant candidates. There are others that are unfortunately too elderly, too fragile, and, and there was, they were not, you know, we knew they had lung fibrosis, but we could not transplant them. One of my close friends from childhood friends is a physician, ended up getting COVID last July from his child got infected and he ended up critically ill and we threw everything under the bus uh, on him right talking about evidence-based medicine I think the hospital where he was even gave him um, you know mucomist IV but one of the drugs that he got early on they were able to get compassionate use of adiptavil which is a vasointestinal peptide and even though he went on ECMO he was in the ICU for for three months uh, he was on FIO2s of 100% they were, we were able to um, airlift him to Jacksonville where they have a very robust lung transplant program. They were able to get him off ECMO and he's back to work and alive and no wow. lung fibrosis, zero, zero lung fibrosis. He got three rounds of plasma. He got plasma exchange. He got steroids from Desivir. He got, you name it, tocilizumab twice. He got everything. But one of the theories, and I don't know if, they, and I don't know why this has not more widely adopted, was the use of the early on of the vasointestinal peptide that maybe perhaps prevented the development of pulmonary fibrosis. I don't know if you have any more data, but this is again from last summer. I have not seen wide adoption of, of adiptavil, at least not in the US or in any guidelines. And I wonder if this might be an effective drug in selected cases to prevent the development of lung fibrosis. That's actually fascinating, fascinating case. And you know, uh, it uh, all uh, you know, all discoveries like this often begin with a single case. Uh, a case you get a hint, then you may, you go and you do a case series, and then you eventually you do a randomized control trial. I hope somebody listen to listens to your experience and does that because if we can prevent fibrosis, that will be an enormous uh, medical advance. Not only in this disease, but in you know, in a variety of diseases, where scar tissue is uh, is the problem. Yeah, I think the hard time we have is that we still don't have a good way of predicting who will develop the fibrosis. Okay, so I think we are getting to the end. Arthur, we would like to thank you a lot for this very interesting and. Uh, Amazing discussion that we that we had. Thanks to everybody for connecting and uh, and, and discussing with us. We had a great time, and uh, I wish you a wonderful evening or morning or anything you are at. <laughs> goodbye. Thank you and goodbye. Bye bye. Good everybody. evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.